Greetings, everybody. It's Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studio, still broadcasting from the last free state in America, Florida. I am joined by my friend and colleague across the pond, Michael Manelli, who is in, in or outside of London at the moment. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to come back on. Great to see you again, because we're always fun. Always a joy. We were just talking in what we in the, in the business call the green room about some of these topics around uh, Bitcoin, digital currency, uh, distributed ledger versus blockchain. Uh, and I'll just I'll, I'll just kick us off a little bit to give our audience a sense of what we were talking about is is I don't think this is, at least in this audience, a contentious proposition that the prevalence of scammers who hyped BTC, who called it Bitcoin, combined with a lot of other scammers who are sprinkling magic blockchain dust on anything to make it sound sexier than it is, uh, has led to two main problems. One is vast confusion in the investing public about what any cryptocurrency actually is, what Bitcoin is, what blockchain is. And I, and I think a good point to kind of kick this around would be, uh, since a lot of people have heard about these ideas for central bank digital currencies, Right, so the Chinese would run one, or maybe the U.S. would run one. Um, and you have some very trenchant thoughts about why what is being hyped as a central bank digital currency actually has nothing at all to do with the blockchain. Am I catching that correctly? Definitely, definitely. I'm still worried though. Why? Why this green room? You know, there's been no makeup artist. I've had nobody doing my nails. <laughs> but we we did provide a lovely fruit basket and some 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 we ice lemon liqueur. <laughs> Champagne service is missing. I, I'm very <laughs> confused, but I'll pretend I'm I'm really there. Yeah. So, uh, I think one of the one of the one of the things that's been interesting has been a twofold. We're talking about uh, a mutual friend of ours, Byron Gilliam, and his yeah. his point about the changing narrative of, of Bitcoin, uh, but there's definitely been a changing narrative um, of blockchain. So Byron says, you know, original Bitcoin was stick it to the man libertarianism, then it moved into, uh, it's gonna be a, a hedge against the dollar collapse, I think that's gonna be an inflation hedge. And it just keeps moving along and there's one day that everybody hopes that they'll find it. But that's part of the, you know, the greater fool theory. Right. Blockchain is, is a bit, different to me i mean it's blockchain is not even actually a distributed ledger uh, it's really just a distributed data structure uh that's a, that's untamperable and as i've pointed out before uh we, we did some research and found a patent from ibm applied for in 76 and i think awarded in 78 for something that is a blockchain so it's right. not a new data structure or anything but it got wrapped All up it really is is appending another block of data to what went before that's it it's a block yeah. the blocks with, with the hash structure or actually what we used to call it was a checksum. So you had a checksum. And this has always been the thing is like, uh, dude, I don't know, maybe, maybe I should wander in for a second on what is a checksum and how it works. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, the checksum is actually that, a sum of a check. Uh, so it was originally used as a, as a device to, uh, to, to allow people to check that a particular number itself was accurate. And it, it was used quite a bit in the States on checks and credit cards. So you get a, you get a long number, but actually the number for your account might be nine digits. And then there's a 10th digit, which is all of those digits summed and then yep. take the last digits. So I go, you know, add up, you know, eight, four, five, seven, five, three, one, one. And I get to a, a number like 87 and I, and I use the seven. So I now go eight, four, five, four, three, two, one, seven. Great. Now, when I read you that over the phone, which is how this used to work, you you'd get to the end and when you typed it in you're like oh wait he must have said something wrong because it doesn't add up to seven now the problem with that of course is it's only one digit and it'll catch things nine times out of ten but not right. anything. i want to ten percent is bad variance for international commerce right. but <laughs> no i i want 99 percent accuracy so you, you put two digits no i want more than that you basically you lengthen it and lengthen it and lengthen it and when it gets long enough, then the odds of a collision of, of false identity are so low uh, that it becomes effectively a unique ID. Uh, and that's the hash. That's because the hash. Uh, in fact, in, the, in 70, I remember in 78, having a discussion at Harvard about the internet of record as opposed to the internet of communication. So we had the internet of comms, you know, TCP, IP whizzing around. And I remember somebody at the lab musing about uh, what would happen? We were sitting around, and it took us about five minutes. And we said, "Well, what we'd do is we'd have a very long checksum, 
and we'd record it. But the problem for us was we were trying to put parabolic guidance systems into 4K. So uh, a 256 byte checksum like today, 16 of them would have taken up all of our memory. So, you know. Leaving very so, little space for missile guidance, which would be a problem. Yeah, we were very good at that. Uh, <laughs> It will even that required a lot of mathematics on, on computational ability in space, but let's not go there. So we knew the answer, um, it was a, but we called it a checksum. And the hash terminology comes later as people realize that very long checksums are the same thing as hashes. There are a few mathematical finesses in there, but broadly that's the case. Um, and that's what makes the blockchain anything other than appended data structure is the use of the hashes. Right. Um, so you and I were then, chatting about, well, yeah, 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 but what's the what's the kind of the blockchain narrative? Uh, and, I, and I think the blockchain narrative was very confused because people would frequently use blockchain to mean cryptocurrencies. Uh, people would use blockchain to mean distributed ledgers. People would use blockchain as everything because blockchain was very trendy. Uh, well, and it's very sexy. Can you imagine if, you know, people would add blockchain to their announcement and their stock uh, would go up 14%. And if that's you sort right. of, you know, you know what? Yeah. We're going to build a distributed database company. You get crickets. Although and I think on YouTube, possibly, I'm not that I'm high up there, which is because I don't get into enough green rooms with decent champagne. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my all time YouTube. Sorry, the Prosecco was not okay. Only French. You got it. All right. We'll make a note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mind is, uh, I think it was a 2014 or 15 short I did called Blockchain uh, is, uh, is Boring, you know, because it, right. it really should be just it a should really be boring. boring. Yeah, it's not a database. It's a it's just a data holding uh, type of structure, and you have to add all that on top of it to use it. And the difficulty I've, I've got is we were using them anyway before Bitcoin came out. Um, we have one called ChainZ, which has been around since '95. Well, implemented '96, designed in '95, uh, and there are a couple of others. I think Stanford University has something. Uh, they have something called Locks and Clocks, which predates Bitcoin as well. And it was used to hold um, archives of academic work so that they couldn't be tampered with. So you, sure. you know, these were my best results. And, right. You know, That's so important. Clock, right. You can't go and modify data to say, look, this drug is fabulous. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, we use Chainsy for that on uh, clinical trials and health mm -hmm. health data. And locks, I thought was funny. It was, uh, it was, it was lots of copies keeps stuff safe or something. You know? uh, <laughs> That, that, that was what it was all about. So um, so now we've got this data structure out there, but then you got to look at the um, at what's happening. We're seeing a narrative now that blockchains are in everything. Now, I don't doubt that a lot of people might well find adding a timestamp, which is all this is, a timestamp and a hash of something that's sticking away. That's what Chainsy does and has been doing for, uh, God, I'm getting old, 20, 27 years or whatever. Um, but, you know, but, but but fine, but I can't imagine that people all over the world who are using databases are, are doing anything other than saying it's also on a blockchain um, because it's trendy. Um, now, that you might need a blockchain if you've got a lot of independent parties trying to timestamp stuff, and well, some of the new application areas might be using it. But I think for the, for the bulk of stuff that's out there, it's not doing that. And the blockchain crowd, desperate to find you know, the greater fools to sell to, are basically putting blockchain on everything and not really distinguishing between databases and blockchain. And we've had some interesting bits too, like you know the collapse of the Maersk IBM one, which has revealed that there really wasn't a lot of blockchain in there at all. At all. Uh, yep. Or R3, which really doesn't use a lot of blockchain at all because blockchains are slow. <laughs> if you're that really is, using a blockchain. The problem is phenomenal for, uh, pristine audit trails, like phenomenal for capturing data in amber so it cannot be changed and for later examination, tremendous. Um, what, what what I'm finding most relevant is that, and, and the people I, tr I kind of am working closely with in the space, um, all they're focused on are better applications, right? No one turns on the computer and says, oh, you know, I'm really excited about this TCP IP, you know, upgrade coming that IEEE is announcing next week because, whoo, that's going to, you know, take off at least a third of a microsecond from my search results. Uh, no one, no one is talking about the underlying technologies that make all the stuff that, that we use daily and that most people have no clue how it works. Right. Um, I always, I always keep thinking of that wonderful um, Monty Python bit where that show was like how to do anything. 
right? Oh, yeah. Come on and say, you know, how to play the flute. Blow in this end and move your fingers up and down. There you go. There, play the flute. And so where I'm finding the 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 fuss and kerfuffle around Bitcoin and all these other cryptocurrencies, which is as uh, arguably the cre- one of the creators of the, this current version of Bitcoin would say, or, is odd because it's neither cryptographic nor is it a currency. Um, I think that big fluff is going away, and those those fluffers who made a lot of money on that are desperate to try to keep it relevant, right? But the real Bitcoin yeah. or real Bitcoin itself, you know, BSV is an effective payment rail system, right? That's the point of it, right? If you try to buy something online for nine cents, right? In a, in a country where that would matter, you can't use Visa because they charge two and a half percent and they've got a $5 minimum. So you know, all of that massive burgeoning economic activity is cut out of the internet system. So the BSV rail system, which people are building apps on right now, allows micropayments because the cost is a fraction of a penny per thousand transactions. That's where the power is coming from. But the people who are using that, and we're looking at a couple of applications for kind of offshore remittances, right? Someone's working, someone from Malaysia is working as a housekeeper in Saudi. They've been paying 11 and 12% transmission fees to get to remit that money back. We can build tools that basically make it frictionless. Give the poor a helping hand in terms of, so, but again, the application is what matters. And the remittance worker values the fact they're not getting ripped off anymore. They don't care how it's done. It can be done with pixie dust and unicorn farts for all they care. And for all they know, it is. And so um, I'm drawn to the the adult applications. You know, yeah, I'm giving you a talk, as you well know, in London in a couple of weeks about using an NFT structure for critical minerals trading in place of futures markets, that kind of thing. And there's a really great kind of industrial professional investor use case. Right, but it's not going to be for everybody, but it still makes sense for that that kind of big scale application of professional investors and, and big scale commodity traders. Um, but smaller versions of that will make sense, right? And I'm curious to see how those come about. But I think my, the thing that I've been coming around to is everyone talks about central bank digital currencies and the libertarians who are paranoid the government can can freeze your money as if they can't now, right? Like I love this. You know, if it's a central, if it's a digital dollar, they'll seize it. They trust me. You piss off the government, they will seize your bank account. They don't need it to be a digital. You've already got a digital dollar. So, I mean, are any of the arguments that you're that you're hearing in the space? Can you parse between those that are rational versus those that are kind of paranoid? <laughs> is is that if that's the right bifurcation? As the usual thing, <laughs> just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just uh, just want to close off that thread though on CBDC that we we started merely for the sake of the, the listeners out there that you know there's a narrative going around again by the you know, the shysters that oh well you know get in now because central banks are coming in on it and if they're coming in on it that only legitimizes it. If you, if you say the cryptocurrency has got uh, two elements to it, it's got a distributed ledger and it's got a consensus mechanism. Um, it's a little difficult to see uh, what's going on. Now, I know the Bank of England in some of its early papers was adamant. We are not using a consensus mechanism. And in fact, why should they? Uh, yeah. If you don't agree with the Bank of England and they issue the currency, tough on you. Yeah. So the consensus mechanism now everybody is starting to admit isn't going to be used by central bank digital currencies. Uh, but now they're saying, oh, it's going to be using the blockchain. Well, I, I know that people have got some experiments going, uh, particularly Project Hamilton, which I, I think it's the Boston Fed is doing. And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of people are looking at it. But there are some central bank digital currency trials actually running with, uh, with which are acting as real money. Yep. And in those trials, to my knowledge, um, they're not using blockchain. And there's a, probably a very good reason for it. Uh, one is it's slow and clunky. So really, they might, well, well, they are using distributed ledger, but a distributed ledger doesn't mean blockchain. We've had distributed ledgers for, for, well, for gosh, for uh, certainly getting on um, proper distributed ledgers, probably around 2000 with Nutella and, and people like that out there. Um, so you know, that's been going for a while. Um, and they there's are always, there's, there's always in those instances be a master that controls them. There's the golden yep. copy that is dispositive. And if there are errors between the golden copy and and a branch, 
Yeah, that's correct. That, that I think is important. Most people don't get that, right? The difference in consensus mechanism is every node votes and 50% plus one win. Whereas yeah. in a distributed ledger controlled by a central authority, the central authority tells you what it is. And if you have something different, you're wrong. Yeah. And so these are databases too, not blockchains, because you want it to run fast. So, right. so, so yes, guess what? Central banks to bring out digital money are using distributed databases. But wait, what's new about that? Nothing. What do you think Visa and MasterCard do? You know, this isn't this isn't rocket science, as they frequently say. Although I have played around with it. Um, the other thing I, I think is important, and this is at, a, at an abstract theoretical point of view, but it, it's very real. If a central bank said, well, look, I'm going to have my ledger, but then I'm going to publish a complete ledger out there. And we get into the anonymity issues and all that, but that's what they've decided to do. And I've decided to do it on a blockchain. What are they going to do when the published blockchain differs from their ledger? Who's going to win? Right. right? Well, exactly. obviously they're going to win. They're the central exactly. bank, so there's no point. Yes. So why publish it in the first place? And they don't, and they're not. Um, and so I think this is something that's there. And I, I'm sure some readers will, you know, poke at it and tell me I'm wrong, and I'm happy to do it. But to my knowledge, I don't believe any of the actual pilots that are being done, and they're more than pilots because people are paying things with it. Yeah, somewhere between a pilot and a, you know, and a limited edition. Um, I don't believe any of them are using blockchain uh at all uh and they're definitely not using consensus so what's the relationship hmm. well uh, databases and computers well well done thank you very much that's a lovely connection right well I, it strikes me that what well, it was funny we lived in australia got 20 years ago now again i used to have hair and it was not white uh i remember when we first encountered the eftpos system easily the most infelicitous acronym ever created and it was electronic financial oh. transaction at point of sale FPOS. Are you kidding me? Right. So, but so it was kind of it was like digital cash. Well, kind of, but it's just a debit card, right? Okay, wonderful. But well, I always get nervous when someone creates a new name, right? A new terminology, right? I, I knew that all of the well, a lot of the cryptocurrency nonsense was was pumping up nonsense to begin with. But the day I knew it was all a lie was a few years ago when someone started talking about, it. and on our system you can stake it. So you mean lend? No, we're staking. Like you're lending. You just we already have a perfectly good word for it. The only reason you create a new word is because it sounds sexy and new, right? Yeah. And I, I roared with laughter and everyone goes, PayPal's a new thing. Well, the guys that created PayPal are geniuses for making a fortune and getting paid by eBay and then selling the thing for a gargantuan amount of <laughs> good for them. But PayPal was Visa. They just gave it a fun new name. Who cares? And so, but again, good. If marketing sizzle makes you money, good on you. But it doesn't mean you create an innovation in any way, um, and so a lot. I, I'm, I, I parse this because we watched, you know, Sam and his idiocy in the FTX. You know, took in nine hundred million dollars for people who should have known about it, known better, like three months before it collapsed. Right, cover that. You know, ad nauseum. I'm done with him. He should go to jail forever. Uh, but hope, that kind of like really put a stake uh, in the heart of this beast because. All those people that kept talking about um, cryptocurrencies as digital gold, well, no, I can't take Bitcoin or Ethereum and turn it into jewelry, right? And it's it, it's not a thing. Um, and they kept talking about that as if it was a store of value, which in, in no case was it. Um, well, you know, not to sound like a complete you know downer on this, the you, I'm, I'm interested that you raised FPOS because uh, another blast from the past is EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. Yep. You know? Oh, yeah. So in the 80s, we had all of these projects to try and get people, when they were communicating, to link uh, and send everything in a standardized format. Some of it was for payments, but it was also for um, uh, inventory management. It was also for what was called in those days material requirements planning. So I could take on a my factory and I could send all these messages and my suppliers would come in and all that. Um, that was an interesting bit. Um, it, it, the web comes out uh, in 92, 93 with the HTML. And I recall an interview uh, with Tim Berners-Lee and he was once asked, you know, kind of what was your greatest mistake? Mm -hmm. And he, he said, he said, one of my things was I cut down SGML to make HTML and I shouldn't have done it. 
Now, the, the history of this is intriguing. Sorry? But part of that was they stripped out security, which left us with a, a, a trusting yeah, network. Well, got a lot of people to engineer. Yeah. So SGML was developed in the 60s um, by IBM in conjunction with two professors from Texas. And the idea behind SGML was that IBM was making all of these manuals and it wanted the manual to be able to be printed on any any of the printers that were available at the time. Right. So you had like, a, you know, you had a line printer, you had a dot matrix printer, you didn't have laser printers. Oh. You didn't have some, but you had a like great that. noise that printed. Water, yeah. <laughs> but let's just take something as simple as the the dot matrix printers couldn't really emphasize something, whereas a, a line printer would go bang, bang on the same thing and then you'd get bold. But the dot matrix printer, you could put an underline on. So IBM said, well, we're going to come up with a way of describing our entire document such that we're able to uh, say, here's the chapter title. And the line printer program would go, oh, chapter title, that's bold, bang, bang. And the dot matrix printer would say, oh, a chapter title, that's underlined, and it would underline it. Right. And that's what they did. It was a very complicated, well, it wasn't was a comic, it was a very rich and, and well thought through system. And Berners Lee's observation was I could take that system and I could use that to display the web pages. Um, and then he decided to cut it down to HTML. But SGML had a huge richness in it of security, uh, but it also had uh, data structures. Hmm. Um, and so as the web got really popular in 95, suddenly people wanted to swap data and then they created XML. And XML was really just taking HTML and adding to it to bring it up to SGML. HTML. Uh, I said they just put it back in. <laughs> and, then, and then we had JSON coming out, which is also related to JSON. So we, we've got this evolution of these documents. And the funny bit is if you've ever tried to do this with real clients, the easiest way to do it is to have, call them forms. And then you sit down with the client and says, I want to do my data. Uh, sorry, I want to do my application. You said, well, just design your form. And right. then the form is it. And then you take the form and you just code it up in JSON and then you're away. And this is where it gets intriguing as well, because most of the EDI projects, such as shipping documentation or materials requirements planning, became XML projects. And have now got JSON. So you've got these libraries of standards in areas like invoices, uh, XBRL, um, which is a you know business reporting language. Um, you've got was it FPML, financial, um, no FRML, financial FRML, reporting yeah. Yeah. language. The XBRL has been used really well. Got, in reporting. And all these are huge bodies of. Do you need uh, a shipping? Uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Bill of lading. Bill of lading. Do you need a crew manifest? Do you need, and you get these things. And I think there's one out there, Bolero, uh, when I was originally involved in it in the 90s, it followed that trajectory. Yeah. They, they, they went through having been an EDI outfit to being an XML outfit. Now, they're, now they do XML and JSON. They started off with about 75 documents. And I think they've now got 450 or something. Um, and there's another one out there called SDOCS, E-S-S-D-O-C-S. It's an Israeli outfit. So you got these sort of, big libraries of what do you need? You need, okay, you need a blank form, you know, you need another blank form. Now, what's interesting to me is these are ideal for blockchain because mm. I can take the form today, fill it in electronically and basically send it off and it's stamped. Uh, okay. And that's what we do a lot of uh, here in London for clients. Now it hasn't taken off uh, internationally because it all, always suffers from this multi-party problem. You know, you, you know, who's the central third party who controls it? Um, that's, and this was that's, interesting. Is that's the exact exact structure we came up for for our critical minerals NFT structure? Oh, is that is that okay. all of the all the legal documentation is embedded in the code um, and is is fillable form fillable by the buyer both counterparts and uh, we as the mining company that are issuing this because it's a, basically a commercial sales contract of minerals we produce or will produce, um, we are the uh, final authority. And mm -hmm. that is what actually made, is making the first users and investors uh, and buyers comfortable, right? Because you're a CFO at an aerospace company, you're buying you know, 10,000 kilograms of samarium oxide from me, right? Whatever it is. 
and you got this NFT structure, um, which we just use because it's convenient and it's, you know, and did we, did we try to take avail, uh, take advantage of the sizzle and NFTs, you know, 18 months ago when we began this? Yes. Does it sound so sexy now? No, but uh, fundamentally the structure still is very useful in terms of data containment. And then uh, because speed doesn't matter, kind of the blockchain approach is worthwhile. We know exactly where it's going, who's selling, who's buying. Um, yeah. And the part where similar to what central bank digital currencies are doing is uh, I, as the controlling uh, uh, entity, I can say, no, I can veto a transaction. Right. And part of that's because of know your customer rules, right? you're not allowed to buy this NFT that gives you the right to do you know, 12 rare earths and tantalum and ovium and then sell it to the government in Pyongyang. Like I'm going to say no to that transaction. I'm not going to say no unreasonably just because I don't like Bobby at, at uh, you know, the, the trading house, but I am going to say no for KYC AML reasons. So I, 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 I do think in some sense the adults are stepping into the room to make use of this technology, whether it was old and now it sounds new, I, in some way I don't care. Um, but there are real uses to it. And for those people who were smart enough to sell jpegs of monkeys to hollywood idiots for 80 grand a pop good for you right well done right uh and and for those who you know were on the buying end of that i hope you liked your collectible art piece which is worth eight cents now whatever <laughs> maybe someday it'll have historical value that's that, yeah that, that, there's that, there's nothing new but your in-depth understanding of that of how the structures have evolved and i think everyone in the market would do well there are a bunch of Tim Berners-Lee uh, interviews av readily available on YouTube, and everyone should go watch them at least once a quarter to remember, this guy's telling me he's created this brand new unique thing. Has he? Has he really? <laughs> or did, did Tim do it decades ago? <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting area to me that uh, we don't spend enough time on the history of technology. Um, and in fact, uh, I've been asked to advise on, on a couple of uh, things over here in the UK on teaching kids about technology. Wow. I actually believe that they, they, they ought to go into museums. Not, 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 I, I'm not asking them to go to the, uh, what's that famous phrase, ontology recapitulates phylogen. Yeah. You know, that, that is, you have to go through the whole process to, to get there. No, but I, I, I really like things like Raspberry Pi, where they... Oh. they they do have to program, and I would. I love that exactly because of that. Because we all of us, right? I love these because for all of us who grew up with line commands, right, in DOS, oh. if all you've ever done is move a mouse and click pictures, you have no idea. No idea of the command line and how useful it is, and uh, you get getting kids really familiar with that is incredibly crucial because they have no idea. What to do except move around the screen and push things that are well i, I put in a huge plug i don't know if you my friend neil stevenson has a book which was written about 25 years ago called in the beginning was the command line <laughs> that's great i'm gonna have to get that in the beginning was the command a little line. pamphlet about neil you know you know the, the great science fiction writer yep and He's basically a, he came up a programming route and then he moved off into doing novels. Right. He's doing it at the time of the command line and he looks at the the way in which the different universes of Apple and Microsoft uh, and Unix all go and 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 that I, I, I'm not gonna I read the book so long ago I won't press it anymore. Right. But from my perspective, um, it's been one of the reasons that Microsoft has had such trouble because when you've got a command line, you immediately have a parsing structure. Once you've got a parsing structure, there has to be a logic to everything that you do. And so if you notice the the, the Unix-based GUIs are, are actually very hyper-logical because they're, they're coming off of a, off of a, off of a structure. Yeah. Back at Harvard in the 70s, we, we had a train track system, I remember, where we we decomposed language. It was all on train tracks. We would produce these diagrams. So, for example, um, we were doing maps for the most part. Uh, so, to show map coordinates. You see what I mean? And you, you would say that, or you would say set left uh, bottom coordinate to you know this, set top right coordinate to that, and then you could go around and, and reset. We we use these train diagrams today. You would use. Um, 
in fact, that was around the time he started to move into Bacchus Nauer form, um, which is often called Bacchus normal form, but it was uh, Bacchus and Nauer, N-A-U-R, are structural and they give you a structure, whereas Microsoft was kind of laying things on just because they looked good. But once you had your command line stuff, you said, oh, well, then I just need to display that as a, as a menu. So that's fine. I, I know what's possible. After, after I say set, I can set the map coordinates, I can set the screen size, I can set the page number, whatever. And then that's all that's possible for that. Right. And that was, um, that, was that old fuck. And that Apple one. has always been done that way. And it's that rigor of, of yeah. That makes yeah, sense. anyway. We just Digressions have... in ancient history, but I, I think it'd be really good if uh, kid, kids had to go to museums just on three visits or something, but it would give them the mentality uh, of it. There's a really cool bit in, in, in the Netherlands. I went into, I don't know if I told you about this, I went to Delft um, last uh, August, and uh, they have a, a museum, but it's not a mu museum. It's a, it's a little, a little area which my, my daughter was uh, panicky about because she gets down there um, to show dad and she goes uh, uh, with a sort of unladylike, oh my, uh, and <laughs> she goes, I thought it said, I, th I thought it said 200 square meters and it's 2000 square meters and dad's eyes are lighting up. As he's true. like, wow. And what it was, was it, they put out a call at the university for everybody to dump all of their old kit. Right. Of all forms, a room of clocks. They've got a room of uh, transformers. They've got a room of meteorological kit. But it's not like a museum in the sense that it's packed because everything is in there. It's like, you know, what do you right. want? And for me, you know, they had, they had analog computers. They had PDPs. They had IBMs. They had various Philips computers. It was just, and th what they use it for is to bring people in so they can see how the same problems have been solved over the centuries or over the decades and what right. people did and then try and get them to puzzle out how is this actually working and that's superb you know for an engineering student to just spend a few days on the history of it pretty cool i um, remember when i, I was lose. my first apple II plus in i think 78 79 maybe and uh it came with the entire schematic of the computer i remember that all the, they all came with this massive you know unfold it it's fascinating right i don't know i did it was nine right but it was it was phenomenal um and with the and the, the manuals and all that began to disappear right when mm. it became less a tool understood by engineers or though those who were inclined towards technical understanding and just became ubiquitous and then it became a consumer toy which is fine Right. That's fine. Um, but the, for that rigor, I, I remember we, we had a talk um, uh, at this mathematics teaching event. Um, the guys at Wolfram are very big on uh, kind of changing mathematical education. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was one of the guys speaking, the guy, I'm blanking on his name entirely. He invented the Raspberry Pi. And so this was back at a UN event in New York 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. And he was the one who was bemoaning the loss of the Apple II Plus and the rest of them for that very reason. He's like, I'm a first year computer science professor, and I think it was at, at uh, one of the English colleges, and it just all, um, he noticed like within a couple of years, this incoming skills had, had dropped precipitously, and that was when Windows became ubiquitous. Well, you know, I, I was here at the time, and, and one of the problems that we had was that the, this is uh, sort of roughly around 1984-ish. The government decided that it wanted to bring out computer skills. And a lot of us said, no, you should really teach people to program. However basic, that's that's the real thing they need to learn. Yep. And instead, they set up this sort of very peculiar circular logic of, of you will need to learn about um, a word processor Excel is a word processor, and then they would they would basically test kids on it. How does a word processor in a sorry, no, did I say word processor a spreadsheet? Right. How does a spreadsheet do this calculation? Well, it does it like Excel does it, and you're like, oh. and so it was very circular. 
indeed. And I remember as well, uh, Arthur Anderson in those days used to have a training course, which was equally pathetic. So it would talk about how you would bring everything together in a block, which was then sent to a mainframe to be processed, which was then sent back and displayed. Now, you know, if you'd ever been on a deck machine, everything was done character by character. You didn't do it as a block, but to, uh, to Arthur Anderson, because all they did was IBM, and that's the way the 3270 terminal worked with OS 360, that's the way computers worked. Right. And, 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 they didn't get, and the, the, the result in the UK um, between Word as, as the word processor and Excel as the spreadsheet um, and PowerPoint as the, you know, the display was, we wound up with a higher share, uh, sorry, Microsoft went up with a higher share, market share in the UK than it actually had in America. And I'm sure they so didn't intend it that way. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, the, the government really didn't think it through. And, and then you had people thinking that they understood computers. No, they understood how Excel works. They understood how it works. It was, it was very, very retrograde. And that's why I like the Raspberry Pi bit. You know, you kind of learn how to program to yeah. some degree. And you need some to do that. To know how things think. Now we teach kids basic projects like using a, a pie with a, your phone interface to turn the lights on and off, whatever. But when when they when they get it and they realize, you know, these seven lines of code made made you know enabled me to open the garage door at a distance, so they love it. Like it's that's awesome, <laughs> right? That's really cool. But uh, well, my, my, my diatribe, good. My diatribe on this is look, you know. Over the last half century, a little bit more actually, half of all inventions have been sticking a computer onto something. Right. You know, sticking it onto my carburetor, sticking it onto a, you know, a saline drip, you know, sticking it onto a temperature device. That's all it's been. And if you want to talk about innovation and management and, and blah, blah, if, if you're a manager, you should be managing innovation. Well, you're lucky because you could study a whole bunch of other disciplines, physics, biology, and blah, 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 and get, become an expert in all of them. And, or you could study computing and do half the inventiveness of the last 70 years. You know? So you ought to do something on computing. And, and when you join Zen, you have to either program or have proved to us you've programmed. Or if you haven't, that's okay. You can still join us. Um, but you have to take CS50, which is an open MOOC on oh, ADX. Yeah, Harvard. <laughs> the old Harvard one, which I took yeah. when I was at Harvard. Uh, well, I didn't actually, but that's not sorry. <laughs> but yeah, the point is you, you, you have to do it. Yeah. And, and my, my teams are often, but you don't want me to be a programmer. No, but you need to understand how programmers think. Yes. And it's a discipline, just like you need to understand how lawyers think. You need to understand how accountants think. These are good disciplines for people in business and six weeks of programming, it's not even a six week course. I think it's about 110 hours in total or something. You know, all we're trying to do is make sure that you understand that that, that train of thought, how that works. And yeah. it is so, so useful. And I, I, I throw out so many of the business courses and replace them with that. Like I would replace them with a small bookkeeping course because um, you need to know how accountants think. And I, I would replace it with a, you know, a mock trial or a mock conveyancing. So you have to go through what a lawyer does. No, it's absolutely true. I, it's it's baffling to me. Like the, I think about just the, the general sorts of analyses that we need to get done all the time. If you don't understand Python or another useful language or R, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you get stuff done. <laughs> I really don't. Just it would be very, very difficult in a data rich world. Um, you know, so much of what I've focused on in my career has been finding the information hiding in data in plain sight. And just yeah. by exploiting the stuff that's there, that's readily available. And that it's it's baffling to me. Like you just, you need this tool to go pick it up. Why would you not get that tool? Right? If someone yeah. told you yeah. this magical golden shovel will find you all the diamonds in that Kimberlite pipe, would you like this magical golden shovel? You would move heaven and earth to get a hold of it. But <laughs> equivalent is Python looking for the trading signals in orange juice futures. Right, you don't need to be Eddie Murphy, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Michael, thank you. Is, are there any? Is, is, what's most salient out of this? This this point, I mean, from what you've been hearing out in the market and all the confusion, and uh, not to kind of overly plug, you know, the NFT thing I'm working on, but like of all the stuff you're seeing out there, what general advice you've given people for how to look at this? How do you instantly know something is nonsense? When something's worth looking at, or 
Do you, do you have a heuristic like that that you're offering up? You mean for just general kind of... Yeah, but um, so it brings you something. It's blockchain, it's distributed database, it's cryptocurrency. I mean, what, what What's the snapshot of the wise words you provide? Well, I, I think the biggest thing to me is that you should always be asking people how things work. And you shouldn't take no for an answer. Honestly, you shouldn't. And when they get the bit, it's too complicated or science all that, then you're being lazy. Or, so, they're, you know, or they're lying or both. Or <laughs> both, yeah. You shouldn't say, um, for example, you know, uh, what's the old expression? You should never invest in anything you don't understand, right? But, right. And it's true. That on the other hand, doesn't mean you can't work and understand something. Right. So, so if you're really interested in a subject area, work and understand it. And don't rely on other people. And I'll give you a, just as a quick example. We ran a course on blockchain uh, with w where we had to touch on cryptocurrencies. We ran this course at Zien uh, up until about two years ago. It, it was a half day course. And do you know what we made people do? We actually made them do a hash. Right. There you uh, go. We had to do a hash no, right. on paper. You know, that's to, and we had a little, um, because they were all excited, we had a card game where we worked out how you did a, um, how you reach consensus on a block. So we did sort of a, a nonce, a nonsing structure and people had to shuffle the cards and then they dealt the cards out and they go, oh, I get it, I get it. Right. Um, but we actually walked them through all the components of it. And I think that any investor should be doing that in anything. So, for example, at the moment, uh, I think uh, when you and I were in in the green room, where the hell is that champagne? I ordered it ages ago. <laughs> it's chilling. Uh, anyway. I will never serve it at that temperature. I'm sorry. I have yeah. standards. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we and I finish talking, it will be chilled. Uh, <laughs> It'll be ready just when I go see it. <laughs> but I, I'm getting into a lot of a lot of analysis and interest in investing in hydrogen based technology. Technologies, but I haven't done anything yet because I'm I'm doing my research, and my research is not reading other people's research reports alone. I'm doing that too, obviously, but I'm I'm trying to get down to the physics. You know, what's the comparative size of, of a hydrogen molecule against a methane? You know, what's the size of a leak? And these are all just things you can work out yourself because yep. there's a pipe. You know, I'm putting something through the pipe. How how strong does the pipe have to be? What's the psi range on it? Uh, when people talk about buffering in the pipe, does that make sense? What about temperature? How much was the thermal expansion of, of hydrogen? And these are just things you, you you should go through and familiarize yourself with. How you're presenting, preventing sparks, all that kind of stuff. Huh. All right, fair enough. So primary research, you're urging people to take a University of Chicago approach to the world and only go to original sources. I appreciate that. that from, from a Harvard man, I appreciate that that acknowledgement. That's really great. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, <laughs> I, hate, I hate those freshwater colleges. Anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I like that. Freshwater college. That's fabulous. I've never heard that before. That's really good. That's really good. Hold that up. As we always said in Illinois, Harvard, Harvard, I've heard of that. Oh, is that the Illinois University of Chicago of the East? <laughs> oh, do you want a funny one? This Please. is this is this is gonna go down to the apocryphal legends thing, but um here here we have City University, and City University has a business school, and City University's business school used to be called City University Business School, which of course became <clears throat> Cubs. And right. they never quite liked that. Um, right. I have a lot of people went to Cubs and they thought that was okay, but the university didn't. So then they took a major donation from uh, CAS, the Sir John CAS Foundation, I believe, from memory. Um, and Ka they then changed the name of the school. My understanding, though, is that the school uh, that the school volunteered the change, and CAS didn't make it a requirement of getting this donation. Uh, anyway, uh, about three years ago, we had this rise in uh, sensitivity about the fact that John Cass had been involved in the slave trade and the school decided to drop the Cass name. Um, and then they cast around for what they would do. But whilst they were waiting, they were called the business school. Right. And their application rate shot up because people were Googling, you know, business school. They found the business well, school. The business school. I mean, There's one. Seriously. This has to be the best. Who, who wants who wants to go to Harvard or Wharton or INSEAD when I could go to 
the business, business school. school. That's anyway, so they renamed they renamed the business school Bayes B A Y E S after the uh, Kent uh, cleric who uh, is there for Bayesian analysis, largely because he's buried, I, I think, about a hundred yards from the school. Um, That's awesome. And, but the one thing I know is, if I ever do attend the Bayes Business School, uh, I'm not taking their marketing course because they know nothing about marketing. Nothing. They had it. They had it, and they lost it. <laughs> and in an odd <laughs> refutation of the good Reverend Bayes, your position on that a priori going into the school would not change a posteriori after being there. <laughs> so Ooh, there's a little irony in that. <laughs> and I will leave that real third joke for my listeners. <laughs> and for those who don't get it or want to beat me for, for saying it, you're more than welcome to do so in the comments. <laughs> so, right. Michael, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in, in, in real live 3D soon. Uh, oh. And the champagne's and chilling. We'll see you over here. And, folks. Oh. Good. and a that? plug, Christopher's on on the 15th of February on our program over at FS Club. Looking forward to it. And I'm very excited about that. So thank you all, and I'll put the link below. And until next time, to my dear listeners, remember, on the whole, turn off the mainstream media because they're just lying to you and tune into messy times. <laughs> Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Bitcoin 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain. Thank you.